Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Investors Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, and by Kessler Foundation, changing the lives of people with disabilities. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, Steve Adubato. We are here at the third annual Montclair Film Festival at the Claridge Theater. Um, there's a lot of buzz here. There are two films that are being shown. One is about Doc Ellis, a baseball player called No-No. It's a documentary, but the film that we're going to be talking to folks about is a documentary called Whitey, the United States of America versus James J. Bolger. That's Whitey Bolger. I'll tell you, a fascinating guy. This is a guy who um, was alleged to have convicted, uh, had 19 murders he, he was charged with. He fled Boston in 1994. 16 years he remained at large. The feds were looking for him. He was hiding out. He was on America's most wanted list. The FBI wanted them, but he was also allegedly an FBI informer. So what we were curious about was, who exactly would be coming to see this story about this film about Whitey Bulger? And then a little bit later on, we'll be talking to Bob Richmond, who was the cinematographer on this film. So uh, first, let's talk to those who have come to the Claridge, to the third annual Montclair Film Festival, to come see the film about Whitey. And then we'll meet the guy who took the pictures, the film, to make it all happen. Steve Adubato, we're at the Claridge Theater. We're about to see Whitey, right? That's right. And tell everyone who you are and why you're here. I'm Julie Cerf. I'm a resident of Montclair. This is my family, husband, mother, brother. We've been going to as many films as we can, and we really want to see this one because uh, it's a really important crime story in America. Yeah, this is the Whitey Bulger story. Whitey, United States of America versus Whitey Bulger. This guy was on the lam for... How many? 16 years, 19 murders, the feds finally got them, and I'm seeing the line starting right here. We're at the Claridge. Real quick, if I, I'm going to ask some folks, how big has the Montclair Film Festival been for our town of Montclair? Oh, I think it's huge. It's a giant um, economic opportunity and also just real excitement for all of the films that have come. Really wonderful. Yeah, I'm going to ask some other reaction. You guys go together, but you don't always have the same point of view, I'm sure. <laughs> Why Whitey? I, I always agree with her. Smart move. They should do a film on that. <laughs> Uh, now I'm a Boston boy, and I and I uh, have followed the Whitey sto Ford story for a long time. So. Yeah, Whitey was from Boston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a, a Boston guy, and uh, Montclair Film Festival is great. It brings the town together. It's a stamp of uh, class for the town uh, in the artistic community, and it's a it's a wonderful innovation. Describe opening night at the Montclair Film Festival. It's it was the event to be at, and it's just a great sense of community, and it's just exciting to be a part of it. Yeah. And why Whitey today? Fascinating, hiding under plain sight, in, in plain sight, hiding for 16 years. Fascinating. And they got him. And they got him. <laughs> and you want to hear that story, right? Absolutely. That's why it's interesting to hear about stories like this that just, in plain view, people are found. It's going to be interesting to see. Who knew? Hide, 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 hiding, hiding out in L.A., who knew? And, and how about those people who say, I love people who say, film is dead. No. Film is dead. No, no. no and film is not dead. Film informs. <laughs> film informs. Why Whitey Bulger and the Whitey Bulger story here at the Claridge, the Montclair Film Festival? Because I've lived in Boston for quite a long time. This is my new home. I lived in Charlestown, and it's the same idea. I mean, Whitey was famous, infamous in, Char in Boston. And, uh, you know, the criminality that exists in Charlestown and in Southie, which is where he was from, it was a big deal. Hi, Steve Adubato. We're here at the uh, Claridge Theater, the Montclair Film Festival. There are folks who are coming here to see Whitey, United States of America versus James J. Bulger. That's Whitey Bulger. It's a great story, a powerful story. Whitey Bulger uh, indicted for 19 murders, FBI informant, 1993, excuse me, 1994, fled Boston into hiding. 16 years, remained at large. And I'm here with uh, Bob Richmond, the cinematographer on this film, worked with uh, the great director Joe Berlinger? Berlinger, yeah. yeah. Let me ask you, describe, we just, we just got a chance to talk to some people who have come to see this film, some are who, who are from Boston, 
and they were describing the intricacies of Boston, South Boston versus regular Boston, and, and how Whitey was from a certain part of Boston. Describe working on this film. Well, <laughs> describe. Well, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience and a very complicated um, trial and, and story. And there was a lot of different aspects. And if you asked me to put together this whole um, story, I couldn't. It's the intricacies of the Justice Department, the FBI, the supposed corruption of the FBI agents, Whitey, and then Boston. Boston is, in a way, a character. And what? Hold on, Boston's a character? Well, it's not in the film, but in going there, it's different than New York. In New York, everybody knows who John Gotti is, but not everybody has had an experience with John Gotti. In Boston, everybody had an experience with, with Whitey Bulger. You went to a restaurant and you said, they said, what are you working on? You say the Whitey Bulger film. They said, well, my uncle had business with him, or I, he used to come into this restaurant. So. Boston is like a big city, but a small town. And that's what, you know, that was the experience for me. And then meeting all the, the uh, families of the victims who were murdered. What was that like? It was heartbreaking. And a lot of them didn't uh, know what happened to their families, members, because the Justice Department was keeping it secret that they were, that Whitey was supposedly being protected by the FBI because he was supposedly an informant. And you'll see in the film, Whitey says he never was an informant. But he was an informant. You watch the film, you decide. You, you know, it's so interesting. While the story is allegedly about Whitey, everything I've read about, and I'm looking forward to seeing it, is that it's a lot, about, a lot more than that. It's also about the justice system. It's also about the FBI and how the FBI operates as the quote-unquote good guys, but have to deal with bad guys to allegedly do what they're supposed to do. I know, it's, I know that's a ridiculously simplistic... There's a guy in the film, Moderano, who committed 20 murders, and he made a deal with the, with the government, got 12 years. 12 years for killing 20 people. He, has, he got money from the government. He's already sold the film rights to his life story. He's out walking free because the government was so involved in getting Whitey. So hold, hold on. So Whitey Bulger is on the land for 16 years. He's indicted for 19 murders. He's embarrassing the federal government because the feds can't get him. And so what happens is they decide he's the guy they have to get. And whatever they have to do to get him, and if I'm wrong, you'll tell me, they do that. And if they have to cut a deal with someone who has information to get Whitey, then that person who they got information from, potentially, you're saying, may get certain treatment from the feds. Is that a poor explanation yeah, no, of it? No, that's what happened. And actually, there was a little bit of a, and you'll see in the film, there are two guys who are caught at the same time. Steve Flemmy, yeah. who is Whitey's partner, and Matarano, who is also like Whitey's Luca Brasi, in a way. And they both know... He's a strong arm guy. Yeah, he was a killer. He says he killed people for Whitey. He killed people, put a gun to somebody's head and shot him in the eye. 19 people, 20 people. They sort of... Oh, and Kevin Weeks, who is a younger guy who is also a killer, who also... Were, Weeks and Fleming got arrested at the same time. And they both knew one of them was going to be able to make a deal, and one of them wasn't. Weeks made the deal. Weeks is out on the street. He's out on the street? Yeah. So is Monterano. And Whitey? What's he facing? Whitey has two, two life sentences. Plus more. I think, yeah. He's, but he's appealing. Whitey claims he had um, immunity from the head of the FBI in Boston. Immunity for 19 murders? No, Whitey wasn't up for 19 murders. I forget how many murders he's up for. So, so, so let me ask you something. It's really a really crazy story about the Justice Department and the FBI. And, and the whole trial, Whitey never disputes the fact that he murdered people, except he disputes the fact that he murdered the two women, because he didn't want to be known as a, a killer of women. Okay, do, do this for us without giving away too much, if you could, Bob. Um, when they find Whitey, when the, when the feds finally find Whitey, He's an older guy. He's not the Whitey Bulger who was in South Boston, allegedly this crime boss, um, deciding who would live and who would die and making a lot of money, whatever. 
He's an old guy. 83. 83, walking around town, um, trying to put tuna fish together in cans and hoarding it and, and, and with toilet paper. What, what is he doing? Where is he hiding the money? He had a ton of money. He had a huge cache of um, guns. Where? In California. He was living like in, I think it was Malibu. He, he was, wasn't living like he had a lot of money. Well, he wa in fact, I knew somebody who knew the landlord of the building he was living in. And she said that this old guy paid in cash every, every month. Was he living high on the hog? He was living well. He had a lot of money. He had his girlfriend. I mean, he kept a low profile, but he was living in Malibu. He was living a few blocks away, supposedly, from the FBI headquarters in, in L.A. How'd they get him? The way You're giving away too much. No, it's not in the film, actually, how they got him. Um, they put out some... They finally put out a, uh, a newspaper, you know, an award, I think. And this woman in Iceland, who was like an ex-beauty queen, who had lived in Malibu and used to see him walking his dog, because she had a dog. She's the one that fingered him. And they fed just around at the house. Yeah. Didn't they find him in the garage? They got him in the garage, and they told him to get on his knees. And he said, I'm not getting on my knee. I'm going to soil my pants on the oil. And so he didn't, he didn't. So he was whitey to the end. He was whitey to the end. Let me ask you, uh, why should people see this film, even if they're not into uh, cops and robbers? Well, I think they should see it because they should see how our justice system works and see what's good and what's bad. And, you know, this idea of give, having a paid informants, yeah. does it work? As someone from Montclair, what would you say about the uh, greatness of the Montclair Film Festival? Oh, it's fantastic. Tom Powers is a great guy. He's done a wonderful job. I think this is going to just get better and better every year. What does it do for filmmakers and folks like yourself who are, great. play great roles? It's great for, for filmmakers. I mean, a lot of people make films that don't have a huge um, financial, you know, they're not, it's not going to get a huge distribution. Uh, festivals like this give you an opportunity to show your film, maybe sell your film. But more importantly, just to show it and have people see what you've done. You put your heart and soul into these things, and it's important people get to see them. If you would like more information on this program, or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Steve Adubato is our honor to have Chuck Workman, Academy Award winner. He presented a film, What is Cinema, right? And you had a talk about it here at the Montclair Film Festival. Describe the film and describe the conversation, Chuck. Yeah, the film was made to uh, talk about other areas of film that is not necessarily mass entertainment, but way that, you know, filmmakers who actually can work in mass entertainment, but are trying to use, make their film it's more artful, use uh, the same elements that, that anybody would use, but, but, make the, but make art out of it. For example? For example, Stanley Kubrick, Orson Welles, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Some elements of Martin Scorsese, some elements not of Martin Scorsese, Fellini. Uh, and also many um, uh, experimental filmmakers who are basically trying to do poetry with their films. So there are plenty of them, and, and I think it's great if we can look at, the, look at it harder and think about that and think about this amazing opportunity we have with film to make more than just mass entertainment, but to make something that's, that, that'll stay with us and, and maybe convey something that can't be conveyed any other way. What kind of reaction do you get, Chuck? I mean, there are so many people here at the Montclair Film Festival. I mean, you got 90 plus films, way more than last year, way more than two years ago. There's a tremendous buzz and excitement. But again, what, you're, what you just described is, is something more challenging for some filmmakers who just said, I just want to come and enjoy the film. I don't want to think about film. Is it a bit challenging for some? No, I think that's a problem. I think that's a, that's, that's a loss that that audience has. Not for my film, certainly, but, but for any film. If somebody says, oh, well, I, I work hard all day. I just want to escape. Fine, go escape. It's OK with me. But? But. There's also the, some of those same people might want to go to a museum, might want to go and look at art, might want to go and listen to, to interesting music or be in an interesting space. Uh, so those same people can get the same out of movies as 
they can out of all those other art forms. But we so are used to uh, this movies being movies and not what I call cinema, what people call cinema. In other words, not some sort of sort of art form that we, I think we cheat ourselves if we don't if we don't really check that out. Help us understand something. For even for a, an avid movie goer but not someone who I would say, I mean, I could sit there and, and describe the film I like, but I'm still gonna, you use cinema and then you say movie, and I have to tell you, I don't know the difference. Well, whether you like it or not has nothing to do with it, usually to the audience, to the maker. They want you to like it, just like they want you to like their, you know, their everything they do, including the, if they made you eggs in the morning, they would like you to like the eggs. But these are people making things for their own sake, uh, in, the, in the same way that other artists are. So the difference is that the, there's less melodrama, there's less sentiment, it's a little harder to get to. There's a much greater interest in the image, in what we're exactly what we're looking at, so that this shot that we're looking at now, they, they would care for, not that you're not caring for it, but it would be an interesting uh, way in the editing, uh, in all the various things that you can add, which you, we're not bringing it and making you, if, if I'm the screen and the audience is out there, I'm asking the audience, come a little closer to the screen and watch a little uh, more carefully. And don't go, I won't come all the way over to you. I'm gonna ask you to watch. In the, and that would, I, I feel, like a novel that you might want to read or something that's a little trickier. Or a little Let me give you an example and tell me if I'm on the right track. I remember watching Taxi Driver for the first time, thinking to myself, I don't know if I like this movie or not, but I'm intrigued by it and I, wanna, I need to see it again. That's cinema. Uh, I think that is. And, and by the way, I don't care if you like it or not. <laughs> Do you think Scorsese cared whether we liked it or not? Scorsese does care, and I think that Scorsese has now moved to much more uh, uh, popular films than he did before, even though the, the artistry is amazing, in, in, you know, the way, the craftsmanship, let me put it. But he has lost, I think, a little bit from Taxi Driver and Raging Bull and um, the films that he made earlier and is making... Uh, you know, terrific movies, but they're movies, and they're, they're basically to get as many asses in the seats as possible. And the Montclair Film Festival has the potential to do what for film and cinema? Montclair Film Festival, this is the first time I'm here, uh, is uh, uh, quite an interesting festival. It, there's no, not as much screwing up as there is in much festivals. Hey, and you see a lot of festivals. I, I've been to 150 <laughs> festivals, so I can tell you a lot about all of them. Uh, and I was telling with the president of the festival that I said that people, all of us who go to a lot of festivals, talk about festivals. And so, do you really? Say, oh, absolutely. This one sucks. This one is stupid. This one only care about the the volunteers. This one doesn't care about the movies. This one is trying to attract Hollywood names. Uh, this one is a nice. Uh, more than nice, it's a, it, it, it's a very interesting collection of films and filmmakers. It's close enough to New York to get some uh, interesting people. And the choices are, are really good. The program, I know the programmer of the documentaries, for instance, the guy's the top guy, uh, probably. Like Tom Powers? Yeah, Tom is. is well, how, why is that so important? Because there's a lot of junk out there. And, you know, of course, this is what I might say is junk that somebody may else, I, I'm not. But on the other hand, they have a good eye for, for what's interesting. They know the filmmakers. They know who's doing something else. They know if you do another film, it may not be as good. They kind of know how to handle that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's just a very interesting way that this uh, place is put together. If you would like more information on this program, or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I'm here with Kristen Connolly, who I'm sure you recognize as Christine Gallagher from Netflix's web series, House of Cards. You're here at the Montclair Film Festival. Tell us what you were doing tonight. I was participating in a conversation called Homegrown, uh, and we were, you know, talking about acting and uh, and about what it's like growing up in Montclair and, and having a career in the arts. Now, you did grow up in Montclair. You were here with Ben Rosenfield, who we know from Boardwalk Empire. What does it feel like for you to come back here 
talk to the community who you once were among, you're now in New York, but and to see them look up to you as a role model now. Oh God, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't think of myself as a role model, but I, I, I think it's, you know, Ben and I both are working in a field that people are, are interested in. And um, so it's really nice to come back and, and talk to people about that experience. And then, and also just to meet Ben and talk to him a little bit about the different experiences we've each had as actors. Did you know Ben growing up? No, I'm a little older than Ben. <laughs> but uh, we just met tonight and he's terrific. He's, he's just a wonderful, lovely guy. You had great rapport and great chemistry together on the stage. But, you know, you, you said that people are interested in the career. And it's true. There's a lot of mystique and intrigue about the world of acting. When you're in it, does it feel quite as glamorous? No, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, even if when you're dressed up and you're doing a red carpet or, or whatever, you know, you're usually in some kind of uncomfortable shoe or, you know, it, it feels glamorous when you look up and you see, um, you know, somebody that you... you you watch on TV or you've seen in movies and then that's really exciting but for the most part you're just going to work and um, you know the, it's long hours on film sets uh, you tend to start early and go late and um, and then you're just you're in it and you're doing your work well you're in it with Kevin Spacey and not many people can say that especially in one of your early early roles what is it like working every day with Kevin uh, Kevin's wonderful he's he's just such an incredible professional and he's such a smart um, thoughtful actor and I I've learned a tremendous amount from him um, and you know he's also a leader I think and the way he he conducts himself on set and um, you know the energy he brings and the 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 quality of his work makes other people want to do better and work harder and you know that's an amazing thing to have did you envision yourself here at this point in your life? Is this where you wanted to be? No, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm certainly grateful for all of the opportunities that I've had. Um, I, I don't think I could have imagined that I would be doing this, um, or certainly not in the way that I have been. And I, I think that's Explain what you mean by that, in, in the way that you have been. Well, you know, I think I did a lot of theater growing up, and, and you know, there was like no such thing as a as a as Netflix or an internet series and so I couldn't have even imagined that this thing existed um, or could exist and um, you know it's been it's great you know it's interesting you are part of kind of a groundswell of a, a new medium this web series it's something that I still call it the TV series house of cards that plays online and it's just a web yeah. series but is this do you feel like you're part of web series <laughs> it is an expensive web series but do you feel like you're part of kind of the next wave uh, sort of, you know, I, I watched most of my TV shows that I like on Netflix anyway, um, or on demand, and I think that's sort of where things are going and have been going for a while, um, and then I think, you know, House of Cards sort of cemented that for Netflix, and then Orange is the New Black came along, and that's and just such a fantastic show. Um, I think if you're doing, if you're doing good work, and you're you're making something that people want to see, then they will watch it wherever it is. And especially if you're doing it in a way where they can watch as much of it as they want at whatever time, um, it, you know, to me, it makes a lot of sense. You know, someone asked you, do you have to go to L.A. to be a successful actress? What do you say to that? I, you know, L.A. is great. There's no reason to not go to L.A., but if you're interested in theater at all, um, you know, there's no place like New York, and I think it's one of the best. Um, it's one of the best learning experiences you can have as an actor is, is being on stage, and I think Ben and I both share a real passion for that. And um, you know, they, you're not going to go wrong. So, if it's not House of Cards, is it Broadway for you? Um, well, I've never been on Broadway, but I, you know, I've I've worked a lot at the Public Theater uh, and in Central Park doing Shakespeare in the Park, and um, I'm kind of a Shakespeare geek. That's my favorite thing, and that's what I studied in grad school to do. And the the TV jobs uh, have really been kind of icing on the cake, and and House of Cards is kind of Shakespearean, I think. Well, we look forward to seeing what you bring us next. And if you're not watching, get Netflix, watch House of Cards. Of course, we're not promoting that you go out and buy Netflix. This is PBS, but you're just phenomenal. And we thank you so much. Thank you so much. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence.
and the Montclair Film Festival, 13 for WNET, and NJTV. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Hackensack University Health Network, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Investors Bank, the Russell Berry Foundation, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Kessler Foundation. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger, powering NJ.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.